We don't even know if these work. How does he have gravity on his eyeballs? I don't understand. And it turned out to be a staggering. Hello and welcome back. About a year ago, I uploaded this video and in the video, I said I expected a couple hundred views. Now it has almost 40,000, which is a lot for this channel to say the least. And it's in the middle of blowing up again. So uh, I have no idea what it's gonna be by the time I actually get this video out. Apparently having Elon Musk in your thumbnail and talking about Starship is a good way to get views on YouTube. But despite that, I'm gonna resist the urge to name this video, Elon Musk finally did it, nuclear powered Starship gravity generator. But this video is actually going to be a follow-up to that original video looking at thrust-based artificial gravity. A lot of people were saying, why not just constantly accelerate? Burn your rocket so you are accelerating in a straight line, not rotating. In, in theory, that would be the best artificial gravity. It would be the closest thing to Earth. As far as Einstein's concerned, it's literally the exact same thing as being on Earth. But is it physically possible to do that? Well, that's what this video is gonna be looking at through a very uh, low level engineering analysis. Now let's start with the assumptions we're gonna make. And this is gonna be very quick, but also very generous to thrust-based artificial gravity. We're going to assume that you're using a very large rocket with a very small payload with some people in it. I'm also gonna assume that you're using some balloon tanks. So they're very thin, very light compared to their massive volume. And then we're gonna take some real world engines that actually exist and we have built and burned, and we're gonna strap a bunch of them to that tank. Now, the reason we are doing it at this large of a scale is we can actually divide the entire rocket up between all of those engines. And that means that each engine is carrying a ton of fuel and then a tiny bit of the tank and a tiny bit of the payload. And we're just gonna say the rocket's so big that the weight of the payload and the weight of the tank don't matter compared to everything else. We're just looking at the weight of the fuel and the engine and nothing else. And that is very generous because I'm basically giving you a free spaceship. NASA would kill to have a zero mass spaceship. This also means we can infinitely throttle our engines so the acceleration is always constant. Usually when you throttle a rocket engine down, you're decreasing the mass flow through the same nozzle geometry. And if you watched one of my previous videos, you would know that decreasing the mass flow is going to decrease the exhaust velocity through that nozzle. That means that your engine's going to be less efficient at actually accelerating you because your exhaust is slower. But we're going to ignore that because you're gonna have hundreds, thousands of engines. Who cares? You can just shut some of them off and keep all of them at 100% and you can perfectly throttle them with no efficiency loss. This is all incredibly unrealistic, but also the best case scenario for thrust-based artificial gravity. We want to give this a fighting chance. Also, we want to make the math very easy because under these assumptions, we only need two numbers from every single engine we're gonna test. That is your thrust to weight and your ISP. That's because we just want to calculate your delta V, which turns out to use this equation and that just has ISP in it, and this ratio of your initial to final mass, and that happens to be the thrust to weight ratio if you're accelerating constantly at 1G. ISP is specific impulse, which is a measure of efficiency for rocket engines. Basically, it's how much acceleration you can get out of every pound or kilogram of fuel. Now, we're also gonna look at Mars gravity, where you can multiply your thrust to weight ratio by about 2.5 in this equation, but it still only requires those two numbers, which makes my research and my math very easy. Now I'm gonna start with the Raptor engine because that original video was about Starship, even though we're not actually building a Starship because this is a big balloon tank thing like I just talked about. And it totally has nothing to do with me wanting to put Starship in the thumbnail again to try to get more attention to this video. Now a Raptor might not be the best engine for artificial gravity, but it does have a decent and uh, by decent, I mean very good thrust to weight ratio of 140 to one. Not as good as Merlin, but it's actually ends up being a better engine than Merlin. And that's because it has a higher specific impulse of 363 seconds, which is 
pretty decent. So I plugged these numbers into a spreadsheet which did all the math to get your delta V, and then we take that delta V for both the Earth case and the Mars case, and we use that to find your total burn time. And it turned out to be a staggering 30 minutes at 1G, and then almost 90 minutes at Mars gravity. Honestly, this is better than I was expecting. My totally out of the blue guess before I did this was like 10 minutes at 1G. So uh, at least it's three times better than that. But for reference, one of the papers I cited in the original video said that you want at least 30 minutes a day of artificial gravity. So at 1G, that's one day of your entire journey to Mars with artificial gravity. Or if you want to do Mars gravity, it's three days, which is also not that much. Now, during that time, you do have a massive amount of delta V, which is interesting, but We'll get to that later. Now, like I said, I didn't expect Raptor to be the pinnacle of artificial gravity technology. And part of that's because if you look at the delta V equation, you see that ISP is proportional to the delta V and thus proportional to the burn time. So if you double your specific impulse, you will double your burn time. But the thrust weight ratio is inside this natural log function, which looks like this if you don't remember that from math class. Now from that plot you can see a couple of things. One, you need a thrust to weight ratio greater than one or else you can't create artificial gravity because your engine's heavier than its own thrust which just doesn't work out. But you can also see that while higher thrust to weight ratios are good, you get diminishing returns. So we kind of want the opposite of the Raptor engine where instead of a high thrust to weight ratio and decent ISP we have high ISP and a decent thrust to weight ratio. For this, we're going to look at hydrogen, which on paper is the best rocket fuel. That's because liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen are the most energy dense, at least by mass. I mean, there are some practical issues with using hydrogen. Obviously it's very leaky, SLS. Also because it's so not dense, because it's literally the smallest element, you need giant tanks to hold it. And you also need a bunch of insulation because liquid hydrogen is very cold and you have to keep it very cold for the entire journey. So that's even more mass on those giant tanks. But like I said, we're ignoring all of that. So hydrogen is perfect. I worked through every hydrogen engine I could find on Wikipedia that had enough data. So sorry, Blue Origin, please release your numbers or I guess someone add them to Wikipedia if they have been released, I couldn't find them. But anyway, the best engine, it was actually a French engine from 1979 called the HM7B. This has been the upper stage for the ESA's Arian launch vehicles from one up to five where it's still flying today. Though they are working on replacing it with another engine, which actually is worse for artificial gravity, but it's probably like, reliable or something. I don't know. Who cares? We just want numbers. Now, the HM7B actually has a lower thrust to weight ratio than the Raptor, like we expected. It's around 84.7, but that's still a lot of fuel per engine. The key is that its ISP is 444.6 seconds, which is higher than the Raptor, so we would expect it to be better. And it turns out that's true. If we look at the numbers here, you have a burn time of 33 minutes at 1G, or 99 minutes at Mars gravity. This is only slightly better than the Raptor engine. It's basically meaningless. You get an extra like three or 10 minutes. That's nothing. Yet this is the absolute best case scenario. We are giving you a free tank, free insulation, all of it, zero mass. It's just fuel, just engine, and you still can't do it. But that's just chemical rockets. There are more advanced types of propulsion, which I have also looked at and tried to find their thrust to weight ratios and their specific impulses. So let's start with everyone's favorite, the nuclear thermal engines. Instead of burning your hydrogen, you run it through a nuclear reactor to superheat it, and then it shoots it out at very high velocities, giving you extremely high ISP. The best nuclear engine I could actually find real numbers for was from the NERVA program, which had a very high ISP of 841, though it sounds like the theoretical is upwards of 1,000. And they were able to get a thrust to weight ratio 
of 1.4. Yeah, it turns out hauling a nuclear reactor around makes your engine pretty heavy. This only gave us four and a half minutes of 1G artificial gravity, which is more than I thought. When I was looking this up, I was expecting a thrust to weight ratio less than one. But in Mars gravity, you actually get 43 minutes, so that's at least one day of artificial gravity. Now, we did see that the Russians, or maybe it was still the Soviets, did also create thermal nuclear engines, and they did have better performance, but I wasn't able to find the numbers, and I didn't look very hard because I'm not expecting them to be substantially larger than what we just saw, it's still probably going to perform worse than methane or hydrogen, at least for artificial gravity. These are still really impressive engines. And of course, there's the whole world of electric engines, which a lot of people mentioned in the comments. But unfortunately, none of these have a thrust to weight ratio greater than one, which means they just can't create artificial gravity without substantial improvements, which would just be me making up numbers or you making up numbers. It means nothing if we've never actually built and tested the engines. Even if we're ignoring the power source you need, which would be massive, they're still adding more mass to the spacecraft than they're adding thrust. This includes all of those out there reactionless thrusters that people were talking about in the comments. We don't even know if these work. They produce tiny amounts of thrust and at least a couple of them have been debunked because the thrust was so small it actually came from external variables which wouldn't exist if you're in space. But even if we assume that some of them that haven't been debunked yet actually do work, they're all way below a thrust to weight ratio of one. So uh, they're just not gonna work for artificial gravity. Now, speaking of the original video, this probably won't be my last follow-up. There's been a lot of discussion over there. So if you're interested in seeing more about this topic, go ahead and subscribe and ring the bell because it's probably gonna be a couple months before I actually get another video out and that way you'll actually see it. But anyway, I hinted at this earlier. Well, all of these technologies, basically all of human achievement has never created an engine that can create artificial gravity. We have created engines that produce a ton of delta V, that meaning change in velocity. It turns out that while well, accelerating for an hour and a half at Mars gravity doesn't really fight off all of the bone loss, it does accelerate you to very, very high speeds, which results in a huge change to your trajectory. The Raptor produced about 20 kilometers per second of velocity by the time you run out of fuel. And the HM7B created 23 kilometers per second. Both of these are more than enough to reach the escape velocity of the sun and leave the solar system entirely. So that high velocity actually shortens the trip to Mars by quite a lot, which means you wouldn't need artificial gravity anyway. Now to figure out exactly how fast you can get to Mars, I created a simulation. If you just do a standard home and transfer, which is the most fuel efficient way to get to Mars, it can take you more than eight months. But in my simulation, I found out that with the hydrogen engine just burning prograde, you can get there in one and a half months. And I also found if you burn away from the sun by about 60 degrees, you can cut that journey even shorter as low as 1.2 months. And keep in mind, all of those numbers are with a vehicle that has a thrust weight ratio of at least 0.4 starting out. Because we don't care about artificial gravity anymore, we could just add more fuel and lower that thrust to weight ratio and get more delta V. So these numbers are actually maybe physically possible because you could just add extra fuel to offset the real weight of the tanks and of the payload. And you can also not have hundreds of engines, you can just have one engine. And that reduces your mass, but you're still gonna have the same ISP. It also opens up the door for all of those advanced technologies we had to shrug off, like nuclear, which has better ISP, or electric, which has insane ISP. None of those are gonna give you artificial gravity, but all of them can cut the journey very short. Now, honestly, we're probably not gonna have enough fuel to cut it down to 1.2 months because again, that's the escape velocity of the sun and you kinda gotta slow down when you get to Mars or else you'll burn up or literally shoot out of the solar system and disappear forever. But it's possible to cut the journey short enough that artificial gravity isn't needed. And that's not using any technology that we 
don't have today that hasn't already flown. You can do this with chemical engines. And we haven't even talked about the fact that you could do a staged rocket where you dump mass, extra tanks or extra engines as they're depleted. So your vehicle stays lighter and you get even more Delta V. Now that does mean that your transfer vehicle would be disposable. So we probably wouldn't do it, but it's an option. It's physically possible. And that would also extend the time you can spend in artificial gravity, but like I said, if you're just going to Mars, there's no point anymore. Anyway, that's all for this time. The next video is probably going to be about short radius centrifuges because everybody was hating on those. I mean, look at this video. His eyes are in the middle. How does he have gravity on his eyeballs? I don't understand. Well, subscribe, ring the bell. I'm Cotton Hathy. Bye.